Hello, Booktube. The other evening, one of these gorgeous, endless early summer evenings where the sunset is still a long way off, but the, the heat of the day is gone, I was out walking with the bean uh, when we're up when we're up on the uh, on the hill. Uh, we can wind in and around these gorgeous little suburban neighborhoods that are just, it's just endless loops and curls that, that take us forever. And that's always a lot of fun. Frida actually very much prefers that to all of our mandatory trips out into the woods and the wilderness. She, she doesn't really like the woods and the wilderness because there's very little chance that we will run into humans that she can yell at to pet her and fuss over her. Whereas when we're out in the suburbs, that is exclusively what she does. You pull up your car and you want to get the groceries out of the car and up the stairs into the house. No, I'm afraid not. First, there's a 10-pound little creature who is screaming at you. First, you have to put the groceries down and you have to pet her and fuss over her. And not just you, but every individual person who's in your party. She will notice how many people there are. And if even one of you tries to cirque your duty, you will get screamed at until she's happy. So it's not that you put the groceries down, you come over and you pet her, and then you say, there we go, that's fine. No, she will tell you when you've petted her enough. If you try to get away before that moment, that moment does come. She doesn't want you to spend all day with her. <laughs> she will dismiss you. But if you try to get away before that moment, she will lean back a little on her haunches, raise her tiny little head, and scream a high, unbroken falsetto note. It can go on, for, that note can rain for a whole minute before she has to take a breath. One person, once upon a time on a walk, bent down over her and was petting her, and then he stopped too early, and she did that. And he said, my, that's a robust, uh, uh, I finally finished his sentence for him. I said, I don't know what to call it either. <laughs> it's not a bark. <laughs> I don't know what it is. But if you're doing that, you have to stop. If you're working in your garden, and you're getting things done, nope, I'm afraid you have to stop. And you don't have to stop just to wave. You have to put your instruments down. Brush yourself off, come over, and fuss with the bean. If you don't, she's just going to keep screaming at you until you do. <laughs> it's lucky that she's so cute. Nobody objects, but still. Uh, we were on one of those walks. We came to a one of those little free libraries. <clears throat> I know a lot of you have little free libraries in your neighborhood, too, and I know that a lot of you like them. I like looking in them. I make sort of an involuntary law not to take anything from them. Good God. I get a lot of books. I have access to, I am in the line of fire of a lot of books. Uh, so taking some from a little free library, if anything, I should be giving them to little free libraries. But I went, I looked in this, I look in them all the time. I always find it fascinating. I, and uh, I looked in one uh, the other day and I found, I saw a book with a homemade cover on it. Not its own original issue dust jacket, but instead something else. And I didn't know what it was at first because the spine was blank. So I took it out. I pulled it out of the library. And the thing that I saw, oh, well, let's just say it brought back memories. <laughs> Someone put a school-issued cover over one of their school books. <laughs> and that's not what you can do for your country. What your country can do for you. <laughs> This is this was made by Holiday Cleaners, distributed to the school. You're supposed to put your school, your name, your classroom on it. Nobody did that, but somebody did this to this book. And I thought, well, okay, I pretty much have to have this book. And it would be it would be tacky in the extreme to take the da the jacket off this book and just keep the jacket. No, I should probably take the book. And I I thought I was getting you know a pig and a poke, but it turns out. Uh, that I, it's a poetry anthology. It's a poetry th anthology from Millen. It's from 1932. Here, we'll stop for the emergency. Uh, it's from 1932, and it's called The New Poetry, an anthology of 20th century verse in English, edited by Harriet Moore and Alice Corbin Henderson. Uh, the New Poetry, only 1932, so not new. <laughs> the 20th century was still new. In fact, the 20th century, uh, in 1932, uh, it thought that it had been through the very worst thing that it could possibly go through. It thought that that was the case. It looked at World War I and thought, World War I, this horrible depression, 
that's about as bad as it gets. They had no idea, no idea at all. Uh, so this isn't this is now old poetry. But I thought, well, okay, I love the nostalgic cover, uh, and it's another poetry anthology, and I have really good luck with those. So I thought, why not read a poem? It's been a while since we read a poem we used to do one every day here. Uh, so I found one. Uh, there are plenty in here. I may go back to this book a few times. This is by Emmanuel Carnivelli. Uh, Emmanuel Carnivelli was a he was born in Italy. He's Florentine. Uh, but he did spend a lot of time in America, totally lucklessly. He wrote poetry. He wrote book criticism. He was very good at, at sniffing out quality literature. And that endeared him to a whole bunch of people. The great short story writer Kay Boyle. Uh, the great, uh, whatever you want to call him, Max Eastman, a whole bunch of people. He, he met a lot of literary people, and most of the literary people who knew him liked him and also liked his work. And he could write in English as well. He wrote, he wrote very, very well in English. Uh, but he had no luck. Uh, he, he, had, he was very Irish in that he could not rub two pennies together. He just could not make money work for him. Uh, and when he was very young, he was uh, actually well into it, well, after he was very young, he was very good looking. Um, and perhaps not unconnected with that, he contracted syphilis at a time when there was precious little that could be done about that. And as a result, had a very rough life that ended prematurely. He did eventually go back to Italy. Uh, but uh, I, won't, I won't gross you out with the details, but it's not an ending that you would wish on your worst enemy. Uh, and it came to him. He wrote until he couldn't write anymore. And uh, he's never, he's gone completely. Carnivale is gone completely. No, no anthology to remember him. There's no collected poetry. There, there's no nothing like that. There's no, no lives as far as I know. Uh, mentions in the lives of other people, in the, in the reminiscences of other people. He also wrote an autobiography that I've never read. Uh, the, I don't remember the name of it. I think it was like the, the Memories of a Hurried Man or something like that. Uh, I've only heard about it. I've never read it. It sounds fascinating. I don't even know if he wrote it originally in English or in Italian, uh, but you never see him. You'll never see him in anthologies nowadays. But back then, <laughs> our two anthologizers did include him. So I want to read you a poem of his, uh, just in case we get back to reading daily poetry. Uh, this is called Sermon, and again, there's there's this book. Has, it's from this is from the 1930s. This has virtually nothing in the way of. Yeah, there are no notes anywhere in here, so I have no idea when this was written. I have no idea if it was written in English or Italian, anything like No idea what period in the author's life it comes from. Uh, but it goes like this, and it's the, the, there's a name that's invoked all throughout here, Chao Meng Mu. Chao Meng Mu is, uh, was the kind of Englishized name at the time, in the 20s and 30s, of an ancient Chinese philosopher. Just so you know, that, that's, it doesn't really matter. that you, you don't really need to know who Chao Meng Mu was, you mainly just need to know that he was the 1920s vision of a Chinese, an ancient Chinese philosopher. In other words, these these ascetic saints who lived on one bowl of rice and valued the simplicity of existence and whatnot. That's the the uh, picture that's being evoked here and used for contrast in the poem. You'll see what I mean. Uh, Chao Meng Mu freely laid his hands over the sky. You do not know how to lay your hands over the breasts of your beloved. Chao Meng Mu made the trees dance at his will. You do not know how to hug a rough tree and say darling to it. Chao Meng Mu magnificently ran a shaft of sunlight to smash against the treetops. You walk carefully, carefully, and fend off the sunlight with your gray clothes, although you're very poor. Chao Meng Mu painted a sky that was a pink-fleshed vase. Then he became a very small thing and hid in the vase. You build yourself immense houses to live in, and you are afraid even there. And that's it. That's the poem. That's that sermon. And what do you take of that, right? Of course, it is the standard 1930s invocation uh, to readers to uh, live less ornate, surfeited lives. Pay attention to the essentials. Live and breathe again, right? That, that sort of thing, that kind of breathe again, go out in the wild, that is the ethos of the time very much the ethos of the time. It filled the lives of people like Owen Wister or Theodore Roosevelt or, uh, thankfully not William R. Taft, but lots of other people too. And, and often, it, it was, uh, often it was exemplified by that kind of a, a cheap and a little bit inaccurate uh, 
comparison with the sages of old, that sort of thing. That's, it's an easy thing, but I really like the poem. I really like how it doesn't care all that much whether you understand its workings. Its sentiments, sure, it knows what it wants to say, and those sentiments are pretty simple, and they run, like I said, they run through the poetry of the era. Uh, but why it does, the way it does what it does, where is the scansion in this verse? I, I have no idea. It definitely has one. It is starchly elegant. But I, you know, ordinarily, I get that right away. My ear picks it up right away. I don't see it here, which leads me to wonder if this is a translated work. Uh, in the 1930s, I am sure that our two anthologizers would not have even thought to include the name of the translator. Uh, I have no idea. Carnival Valley wrote in English quite a bit and very well, so it could be either way. But there's a little blast from the past. This whole book was a little blast from the past. I took it out of that free library and just finished our walk with it, carrying around with a book in my hand, which <laughs> felt a little natural, to tell you the truth. So that is uh, a poem for Friday. <laughs> Will we read another poem tomorrow? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I read a poetry a poem every every day for a good chunk of 2022. Uh, and then I stopped because I thought poetry was for losers. <laughs> and I haven't heard much from the rest of you <laughs> as to whether or not you want to continue, but uh, I may go through a few more poems in this book. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to wrap this up for now, just an impromptu poetry reading, but I will see you soon. Thank you, BookTube.